Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here. My name is Brian Mosley, as I introduced myself at the beginning of service. Uh, I serve as the lead pastor here, so thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. I want to welcome also those of you who may be tuning in uh, by way of YouTube. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. I feel like God wants to share a, a, a profound word with us today, a word of encouragement, a word of challenge. How many of you guys like to be challenged in the word to, you know, your, to grow? to grow spiritually, to take your next steps in your relationship with God. Well, today we're going to continue on a teaching series, as Ashley said, called Spiritual Habits. Would you say that with me? Spiritual Habits. During this series, and, and honestly, during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, we're, we're seeking God to bring revival, to bring breakthrough, to bring healing and salvation to our families, to our, ch- our church, to our city, to even to our nation. We're praying along those lines, but also, as I shared with you last week and challenged you last week, I want to invite you to pray about you. I want to invite you to pray about your spiritual life. I want to invite you to pray about your spiritual growth. Okay, I don't know how many times people have asked you or how many people you have in your life asking you, how are you doing in your spiritual walk with God? I want to be one of those people who are always asking you. So you're always thinking because we never need to grow stagnant in our relationship with God. We always need to reject and resist any kind of complacency or laziness in our spiritual walk with God. But we need to be always asking God, how am I doing spiritually? Am I walking with you faithfully? Am I doing those things intentionally? Do I have a plan for intentional spiritual growth in my life? So I love what John Maxwell, leadership expert guy, said, and I shared this last week. I want to share it again this week. He said this, everything worthwhile is uphill. Boy, isn't that true? Most people have uphill dreams, but downhill habits. Have, you have to intentionally turn downhill sliding into uphill climbing. And boy, isn't that true even in our spiritual lives? Because guess what? When we're complacent, when we're, when we're uh, stagnant, what's that called? It's called coasting. And how many of you know when you're coasting, you're going downhill, right? Think about it. The only time you're coasting, like when you're riding a bike, you can't coast uphill. Hello. You coast and you're going downhill. So what we need to think about is how do we turn that downhill sliding, turn that around in the Lord and with our own spiritual habits and turn that into an uphill climb to our relationship With God. And as I shared last week, spiritual habits are not the goal in and of themselves. When we practice spiritual habits, we place ourselves in a position for God to transform us, for God to work in our lives, for Him to begin to change us and mold us and make us that vessel, make us that offering that we sang about a little bit early. That's what spiritual habits are all about. Now, we look to the word of God because we want to know the truth about what it says. So the apostle Paul comes along in 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open there. It'll be up on the screen as well. I like to give a lot of notes, so jot jot these things down as we go. But Paul the apostle said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, he said this, Don't waste time arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. Spend your time and energy in what? In the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. In other words, there's a responsibility that you and I have to make sure that we are spending our time, our energy to make sure we are being spiritually fit. It's not that God does everything without us. No, he wants to involve us. He, he asks for our participation. He asks for our cooperation. And this is why Paul the Apostle says, don't waste your time on this or that, but spend your energy and your time on the spiritual things of your life. So let me ask you again, how is your spiritual 
life today. Well, Paul goes on to say bodily exercise is all right. Like having a membership at the gym, at the Y, at the, at the health club, all that is great and wonderful, and we should be taking care of ourselves physically. But he says, but spiritual exercise, look at it, is much more important and is a tonic for all that you do. So exercise yourself spiritually, he said, and practice being a better Christian because that will help you not only now in this life, but also in the next life to spiritual habits. How are your spiritual habits? Today I want to talk to you specifically about the habit of prayer. Somebody say, uh-oh. All right, we're going to talk about prayer today, how important that is. But I want to ask you specifically, not just about your spiritual life, but I want to ask you about your prayer life. How is your prayer life going? Would you just take a moment and find maybe two or three people around you and ask them, how is your prayer life today? All right, so have you ever felt like your prayer life was a little bit lukewarm? Not hot, not cold. There's nothing good about lukewarm coffee. Amen? Okay. I don't even like cold coffee. Give me some hot stuff and I'll go with that. But um, for that, I mean, nothing good it comes out of lukewarm coffee. And honestly, when we're talking about our faith in God, our spiritual life, uh, the same is true. Lukewarm faith is no good. In fact, Jesus said this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. He said this to the church. He said, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one. So that because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. Now, we don't want to be spit out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus, right? We, Jesus is saying, I would rather you be hot or cold, not just lukewarm somewhere in the middle. And this is what I believe that God is saying to the church because developing strong spiritual habits is how we grow hot in our faith. You want to be hot in your relationship with God? Then think about your spiritual habits not on Sunday, my goodness, you're here, you're, you're hungry for God, you're here to worship, and I commend you for that. But what's your spiritual life like during Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and, and th all throughout the week? What are your spiritual habits daily? What do they look like? Because it's through our spiritual habits that we grow stronger. It's through spiritual habits like prayer that God works maturity in our hearts. It's through these kinds of spiritual habits that we become shaped and molded. And we become the men and women and the warriors that God has called each of us to be. It's through those spiritual habits. And I believe that as I've been praying and, and meditating on what to share with you today, I believe that God is calling us higher, specifically in this area of prayer. God is calling us higher. He's calling us back to our prayer rooms. Not just on a Sunday, but during the week. He's calling us back to private, powerful prayer times. He's calling us back to that secret place that maybe you once had, but now you kind of got a little lukewarm maybe, or maybe you've been hot and God's just calling you hotter. God's calling you deeper and calling you to spend more time and, and just we need to get out of lukewarmness, reject it altogether and say, no more laziness, no more complacency. I'm getting hot in my relationship with God and I'm using the tools called the spiritual habits to do so. I hear the Holy Spirit calling the people of God back to prayer. Real prayer, like powerful prayer, effective prayer, constant prayer, passionate prayer, persevering prayer, healing prayer, 
faith-filled and bold prayer. But how do we get there? What steps do we need to take? How would the Lord lead me back into that spiritual habit? I believe the Lord wants you to know three important truths today. Jot these down if you're taking notes with me. Number one is this. Prayer is expected. We have to start there, right? Prayer is absolutely expected. Jesus expects us to pray. I mean, if you read the Gospels, you hear scriptures like Matthew 6, 5. He says, and when you pray, right? He didn't say if for some reason you decide that you feel like praying, okay? He said when you pray. And the next verse says, and when you pray. And Matthew 6, 7 says, and when you pray. Are you, getting the, are you getting the point here? Matthew 6, 9, it says, this then is how you should pray. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. In Luke 11, verse 9, it says, so I say to you, ask and seek and knock. What's he talking about? Prayer. And in Luke 18, verse 1, they said, they, it says, they, then Jesus told his disciples that they should always pray. And it goes on to say, and never, ever give up. Suppose Jesus appeared to us just personally right now. Would that change how you think about prayer. If Jesus looked at you in the face and called you by name and said these verses to you, would that change your thoughts about prayer? Because the words of Jesus are not just for those back then, those disciples back then, they're for each one of us. And the expectation is still the same, that we become people of prayer. Amen? God's word makes it clear. Jesus didn't just say it, but the rest of God's word says things like, look at these two verses. This is one in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. The apostle Paul said this, devote yourselves to playing the Xbox. Devote yourselves to your money and your career. Devote yourselves to uh, finding all the entertainment and all the feel-good stuff that you can find, right? Oh, that's the wrong version. Okay. It says devote yourselves to what? To prayer. Being watchful and thankful. We're all devoted to something, right? Right? Most of us are devoted to many things. When, you, when, you, when you're devoted to something, you make it a priority. You sacrifice for it. You give your time and your energy to it. God expects the Christian to be devoted to prayer. Amen? Everybody still with me? Everybody still okay? All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, don't just be devoted to prayer, but pray continually. Pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. Now, what, is, what in the world does that mean? You might think of it like this, as communicating with God on one line, and you have, inter you have frequent interruptions, you have other people, you have meetings, you have things going on on the other line. But God never leaves the one line, right? He's this a con continual conversation with God with frequent interruptions during your day. But that awareness of his presence, that awareness of your need for him, that awareness of communication with him never really stops. These two verses are direct commands. They're not suggestions. They're not options. This means that too little time, too many responsibilities, too many kids, too much work, too little desire, too little experience, do not exempt us from the expectation to pray. God expects every Christian. You love me, don't you? Okay, I love you too. 
God expects every Christian to be devoted to prayer and to pray continually. <clears throat> Martin Luther said this. Uh, this is up on the screen. It says, as it is the business of tailors to make clothes... And of cobblers to mend shoes, so it is the business of Christians to pray. Not only is prayer expected, number two, jot this down, prayer is learned. Prayer is learned. When you first become a Christian, when you first become born again, there's no expectation that you already know how to pray. No, prayer is learned. Prayer is learned. Um, if we're going to develop the strong habit of spiritual prayer, of, of, of the strong spiritual habit of prayer, we need to echo the request of the disciple that came to Jesus and said this in Luke 11, verse 1. Lord, teach us to pray. Everybody say that with me. Lord, teach us to pray. Now I want you to make it personal, okay? Lord, teach me to pray. Say it with me. Lord, teach me to pray. How do we learn to pray? Number one, by praying. Okay, Brian, you should have studied a lot harder for that one right there. <laughs> we learn by doing. Amen? How do we learn to ride a bike? Well, we get on it. And we practice, and we fall, and we fail. Boy, I remember the first time I, I was teaching Garrison, our oldest son, to ride his bike in our neighborhood. And boy, it woke the entire neighborhood up because it was a traumatic event, apparently, for him. He got on his bike, and I'm holding the seat and kind of riding with him, and he would go a few feet, and then he would kind of fall over. But I would be right there to help him, to catch him. But he was so scared. He was so terrified. But how did he learn to eventually ride his bike? He had to ride his bike. How do you learn to pray? Well, you have to spend time praying. And as you do, the Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Word of God will instruct you. You get it. We'll talk about this. You get around other people who have maybe a little bit more prayer experience than you, and you learn to pray. You need to know that. And it's, prayer is not only expected, but it is learned. First, you learn by doing. Secondly, you learn by meditating on Scripture. Talked a little bit about this last week, the importance of Bible intake. But this is, this is in response to the disciples' request. Think about this. To, to know how to pray, the Lord responded and said and gave us what we commonly call the Lord's prayer. He said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said in response in Matthew chapter 6, he said, this then is how you should pray. And then he goes on to fill in all the blanks there, but I want you to think about the Lord's Prayer as not just something to recite, but it's actually, an, and it can be an outline for your private time of prayer. I want you to think about this this morning. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. He starts off with our Father in heaven. What is that? It's the first point in the outline. It's connect with God relationally. Be in relationship with him. This is not about a religion. It's, he, he's not an impersonable uh, force in the cosmi cosmos somewhere. No, he is father. He is your father. You connect with God relationally. And then it goes on to say, hallowed be his name. Boy, isn't that appropriate that you just begin to worship him. Revere who he is. Worship his name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, right? The righteous run into it and are safe. So you first connect with God. This is how Jesus is teaching. You connect with God relationally, and then you begin to worship who he is. And think about how he's revealed in the scripture. 
Next it says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what's this about? It's about praying his agenda first. Oh my goodness, I'm so guilty of this because I like to pray my agenda first. All right, Lord, this is what I got got going on. Lord, this is what I need. This is what I'm struggling with and I need your help with. But look, right here at the beginning of this outline, you connect with God relationally. You bring into praise and to worship who he is. And then you say, Lord, I want what you want. What's on your heart today? What are you dreaming about today, God? And how can I get involved in that? Because it's not about me first. This is about you, God. Because you're God and I'm not. And I like to tell you and remind you, you're not the fourth member of the Trinity. So there's only room for like one person upon the throne and it's not you. So during your time of prayer, just go ahead and get off that throne and say, I want your agenda first. Now remember, we're learning how to pray. By how? By meditating on the scripture. By spending time looking at what Jesus said and what other people said about prayer. Next it says this, give us today our daily bread. What is that? That's God, I'm depending on you for everything. Everything that I need. Everything that's going on in my life, I'm trusting you. I'm relying on you with no holding back. Everything that I have is yours. My present, my past, my future. Boy, I'm a living sacrifice. I am giving it completely to you. I trust you for everything. Every provision, every piece of wisdom and understanding I need for my journey. I am trusting you for everything. Give me today my daily bread. Because I just got to make it one more day. And I cannot do it without you, Lord. So be there. Then he goes on to say, forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And what's that? You take time to make sure that your heart is right with God. And that your heart is right with everybody else in this world. You need to take time. Make amends, ask for forgiveness, extend forgiveness wherever the Lord puts his finger on. Make sure that your heart is right with God. What's what's he doing here? He's given us an outline for prayer during our specific times of prayer. Maybe not just something to recite, but he's giving us what to focus on. Because he said, this then is how you should pray. He goes on to say this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, right? And what's that all about? That's all about spiritual warfare. Man, we've got to put on our armor. We have to take time to put on the armor of God, put on that helmet, put on that breastplate, put on that that belt, and wield that sword and that shield and, and all of those things which the word of God instructs us to. We need to Stand firm on the word of God and pray that we would resist the devil and that he would flee from us as we submit to God. Amen? Then he goes on to say, I love this part, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In other words, what do you do? You express faith and trust in God's ability. Man, God can make it happen. God is bigger than oftentimes we think he is. Boy, he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing, and he is, he is everywhere all the time. And my friends today, let me encourage you. You can trust him. You can trust him even when things seem hard and rough and like there's a storm going on in your life. My friends, God has the ability to make things smooth again, to bring calmness to the situation. But he can bring provision where there is lack. He can bring peace where there is chaos. My friends, this is the power of our God. 
Amen. So we think about and we take time to express our faith in his ability. And that gives us a pattern, an outline for prayer. Because prayer is not only expected, but also it is learned as we pray and consider what is taught in Scripture. Amen? The next thing is this, by praying with other people. By praying with others. There's something powerful about rubbing elbows with other people who may have a little bit more prayer experience than you. Don't be intimidated by those people, but seek them out would be my advice to you. Seek them out and say, hey, can we pray together sometime? I'm looking for a prayer partner. I'm looking for a prayer group to be a part of where people are more experienced at praying than, than I am. This is how we learn. We get around people. We hang out with people. We pray with people who are, who are more prayer warrior than, than, than we are. Praying with others also strengthens the impact of our prayers. Boy, if prayers are powerful and effective when one person prays, think about if two or three or four get together and are bombarding heaven about an issue or a concern. It strengthens the impact of our prayer when we're unified, when we're gathered together with other believers. And also this, many of us don't like this this truth, but praying with others increases our accountability to actually pray, right? When you have a prayer partner or when you have a group, it will help you stay faithful to pray even when you don't feel like it, right? Okay, by praying with others, that's how we learn. And lastly, I would say by reading about prayer. My goodness, there's libraries full of books about prayer and about prayer warriors of the past, not only from scripture, but people who have walked with God in years and decades past. Such insights, such resources for us to think about. What was it, when was the last time you read a book or anything uh, in, in addition to the word of God about prayer? Maybe God, would be, maybe God would be pleased if you read something during this 21 days of prayer and fasting. One of, one of the things that I like to read is this. It's by, the last name of the author is Copeland, and it's called Prayers That Avail Much. I use it as a resource, so it's packed, jammed full with the Word of God. A member of our church actually gave this book to me and just it has helped me like if you're going through a certain situation or you're praying for a loved one or you're, you you want to pray about the the well-being of of your friend or whatever the situation may be you're dealing with fear or worry or whatever it gives you an, a template based on the scriptures of how to pray tremendous resource to continue to teach you to allow the Lord to teach you how to be more of a prayer warrior. So prayer is expected. Prayer is learned. And number three, I would say, and this is my favorite thing, prayer is answered. Man, this is the good, this is the good news. And this is what I want to encourage everyone here with. Yes, prayer is expected. Yes, prayer is learned. Yes, it can be hard work. But listen to me. When you learn how to pray and you spend time seeking God, you can trust in the faithfulness of God to answer your prayers. Well, I thought the amen on that one would be a lot stronger. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8 says this. Man, this is so good. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, well, he might receive if God. If the circumstances are right, or if God feels like it on that, on that certain time. Okay. So for everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, 
finds, thank you, and the one who knocks, the door will be slammed shut in their face. Okay, no. Brian, you're reading out the wrong scripture here. The door will be open. Let me encourage you and tell you this. Where God leads you to pray, he means for you to receive. Where God leads you to pray about any situation or about anything going on in your, in your life. If he leads you to pray about a certain situation or a move or a loved one, there's a reason why he's speaking to you to pray. It's because he means to answer. God's not going to lead you to pray about something and then frustrate you and slam, the, slam heaven's door in your face. When he leads you to pray about something, when he gives you a spiritual desire to pray about something or some situation or some person, he means for you to receive. You can count on that. He is faithful. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, it says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, what? He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Boy, this is the confidence that we have. When we come to God and we express our needs and God leads us to pray about a certain situation or topic or person or even ourselves, God means us to receive. My friends, he is faithful. Let me encourage you, if you've been praying for a specific situation, you've been praying about whatever is going on in your life, my friends, I want you to know from the word of God that he hears you in Jesus' name. He hears your prayers, and you can count on him. My God is faithful. You can count on him, and this is the confidence that we have, right? If, he, if we know that he hears us, we can know that we have what we have asked for. He is good. We sang about it earlier. He is faithful. And he hears us. And he answers our prayers. And my prayer, especially as we've been going into this 21 days of of prayer and fasting, is that we would discipline ourselves, as the scripture says, for the purpose of godliness. That we would develop the spiritual habits of Bible intake, which I talked about last week, and prayer that I'm talking about today. And we're going to continue to talk about different things for the rest of this month. But my prayer is that we might experience the joy of answered prayer. The joy of answered prayer. How many of us would be surprised? Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how many times I've prayed about something and I was surprised when it actually happened. (laughs) Many of you are going to be surprised at God's goodness. You're going to be surprised that he hears you and that your answer has come. You're going to be surprised and you're going to say, Pastor Brian, you remember that sermon you preached on prayer? Well, I applied that to my life, and God has astounded me because he answered in this way and that way. And Pastor Brian, he is good. He is faithful, and he does answer us when we call out to him. My friends, prayer can be hard work. That's why they call it a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual habit. It's a spiritual work. But it's, it's not something that necessarily comes naturally all the time. But my friends, prayer is absolutely life-changing. And so rewarding to learn how to do it effectively And powerfully, I had a friend once, a pastor friend of mine, who who would always tell me, prayer is not so much something that you do, 
than someone that you're with. Prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is about a heart devotion to God. It's about communicating with your creator, your father God, to have relationship with him. Boy, that's the whole, that's the whole point of Christianity, right? A, a relationship with God for eternity through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what prayer is all about. Not only is it transformational to your life, but my friends, as God uses your life as a prayer warrior, your prayers will impact and influence other people around you. Because God is looking to connect prayer warriors with people who, who need prayer, right? And their lives will be transformed and touched forever.